Good evening, everybody, and it's lovely to see so many of you here tonight. I'm Jane Howitt, and I'm the chaplain here at the University of Harriet Watt. Before we begin tonight's proceedings, there are a few housekeeping notices that I have to share with you. And the first is to say that we're not expecting to have a fire a drill and a fire alarm test. So if by any chance the fire alarm sounder goes off, would you please uh, exit uh, the auditorium through the fire exits here and behind me, right at the top of the stairs, and then exit again from the building and there will be people to show you the, the way to go. Um, and please do that if that happens. Um, secondly, I just want to ask you, I'm sure many of you, if not all, will have a mobile phone with you. And now is the time to make sure that it is either switched off or it is on silent, please, so that we don't have any interruptions during the lecture, because the lecture will be being recorded and it will be available to view afterwards. So I think those are all the housekeeping notices. So it is, as I said, a real pleasure to see everybody here this evening. And it is now my pleasure and privilege to ask uh, Professor Richard Williams, who is the Principal and Vice-Chancellor of the University, to welcome you on behalf of Harriet Watt University tonight. Well, thank you very much, Jane, and good evening, and may I welcome you to the university and to this uh, annual chaplaincy lecture. It's great to see so many people here. And unlike some universities, Harriet Watt is a university where we're not afraid to talk about faith. And that, of course, is because we are a multicultural university, having staff and students from many cultures, from many faiths and beliefs, and also students without uh, a faith and belief. As a university, we have around 30,000 people in our immediate community, based around our five campuses in three countries. And of course, during this period following the pandemic, we have really enjoyed getting embedded in our community again, in all of our locations and that's why this lecture tonight is such a special for us and a great uh, privilege for us as well. About one third of our residential students are uh, in Scotland and two thirds are, are outside of Scotland and we are working with around 150,000 uh, living alumni in 190 countries and I'm pleased to say that we will be able to share this lecture with our whole global community. So it's a, a really important event for us. So could I thank you for being here and part of this celebration? And I'd also very much like to welcome some representatives from other organizations who are here, from the Institute of Physics, from the Royal Society of Edinburgh, from the University of Edinburgh and Cambridge Royal Observatory, uh, from the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland and New College Edinburgh. Uh, tonight, I believe we will underscore again and shine a light on the reality that science and faith are to be celebrated. And they're not somehow mutually exclusive, but recognized as having a valid place in academia. Science and faith, of course, are ubiquitous in our experience here on Earth. And I'm certain that our speaker tonight, Brother Guy, is going to expand our understanding to uh, celestial perspectives and beyond from our lecture tonight. And so uh, now I'm just going to hand back to Jane to introduce Brother Guy, and we'll get on with the real event. Thank you for coming. So it is a pleasure to welcome Brother Guy Consul Manuel as our speaker this evening. He's following in a long line now of distinguished guests invited to enable our reflection 
upon matters of science and belief. And it is to the credit of the university that this is a place where matters of faith and belief can be discussed openly and done so in an atmosphere of respect. And so at the conclusion of the lecture, we'll have an opportunity to ask questions relating to what we've heard. This evening, the director of the Vatican Observatory comes to us as an accomplished and much cited scientist, but also as a person of deep Christian faith. The list of Brother Guy's qualifications is very long, and you can research them later if you haven't done so already. Suffice to say that he's a graduate of MIT, obtained his doc doctorate in planetary science from the University of Arizona. He is a recipient of numerous awards, author of several books, including Turn Left at Orion, Brother Astronomer, and Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial? <laughs> a question I'm very glad I haven't been asked in my ministry. <laughs> Guy's particular passion relates to meteorites and the connection between them and asteroids. For a while, he was keeper of the Vatican's collection of meteorites. Indeed, in 1996, he spent six weeks in Antarctica on the blue ice collecting meteorites. He is also a keen historian, a huge science fiction fan, and as I've discovered over this weekend, just a great human being to be with. So please join me in welcoming Brother Guy Consul Manuel now to deliver the Harriet Watt Annual Chaplaincy Lecture 2023 from Peru to Mars. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank all of you for coming and thank you very much for inviting me here. Ah, we do have the first slide. I'm presenting this talk. It's a survey of Jesuits in science, and I'm doing this as a Jesuit scientist myself. I'm not a historian, and so I've relied on the work of other historians, including Father uh, Augustin Udias, who's a Jesuit working in Madrid, Father Sabina Maffeo, who wrote a history of the Vatican Observatory, and a biography of uh, Angelo Secchi by Dr. Ileana Canici, who's a historian of astronomy at the University of Palermo and an adjunct member of the Vatican Observatory. My plan is to give a thumbnail series of sketches of various Jesuit scientists working over a span of 400 years, and I hope to bring out some of the rather interesting and peculiar things that Jesuits have done in the history of science to see what trends you might be able to see in how they do science, to see if there is anything distinctively Jesuit about the way they do science. What all the scientists I'm talking about do have in common is that they're Jesuits. And so these are some of the books that I've been relying on uh, in the talk that I'm giving today. In the autobiography of St. Ignatius of Loyola, we read that the greatest consolation that he received was from gazing at the sky and stars, and this he did often and for quite a long time. Now, who are the Jesuits? The Jesuits are a Catholic, Roman Catholic religious order founded by St. Ignatius of Loyola in the 1500s. More properly, they're called the Society of Jesus. We Jesuits are dedicated to becoming close to Jesus. Jesus as God's incarnation in this physical universe. The first Jesuits were a group of men who all met at the University of Paris. And so scholarship was immediately part of who they were and what they brought as they formed the society. Their unity of hearts and minds began by being students together. Their scholarship from the beginning was at the highest university level. It included expertise in all of the subjects of the university, not only theology or philosophy, but the subjects of the quadrivium, mathematics, music, geometry, and astronomy. 
The heart of Jesuit spirituality is found in the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. And these are a series of prayers whose common theme is to identify and place God's presence in the physical universe, in specific times, specific places, in salvation history, in our own history. And notice the principle and foundation that you find here. I've highlighted certain words you see over and over again. Created things, created to praise, things of the world that have been created. We use things, we are indifferent to things that don't lead us to God. We're not to desire things, but to help us become what God created us to be. All of these things in the world have been created. Created things lead us to God. And this leads to the famous Jesuit mantra to find God in all things. And that's a phrase you may have heard, oh, find God in all things, or I find God in everything. The word thing is important here. The spirituality of the Jesuits is all about our place in creation, why we are created, why the world is created, how we relate to creation. Being close to the created world is a way of being close to the creator. And so it's not surprising that science has played an important role in the history of the Jesuits. My first example is Father Jose de Acosta. He was born in Spain in 1540, which was the year the Jesuit order was founded. He entered the Jesuits 13 years later at the age of 13. In 1572, he was sent to America. As a part of the third Jesuit expedition there, he remained there for 15 years. He traveled to Peru, to Bolivia, to Chile, to Mexico, and then he returned to Spain in 1587. And he held a number of university posts there. He played important roles of diplomacy between the King of Spain and the Pope. Eventually, he became the rector of the Jesuit College at Salamanca, which is where he was when he died in 1600. When he was back in Spain, Acosta wrote a number of books about his experiences, most notably a book, De Natura Novus Orbis, on the nature of the New World. And this was a description of the flora and fauna of the Americas, and the book was eventually translated from Latin into Spanish, and it led to a series of seven books published collectively as The Natural and Social History of the Indies. First three books cover geography, climate, and geology of what you find in the Americas, describing earthquakes, describing volcanoes. The fourth book is all about minerals and plants and animals, and the final three books are about the peoples that he encountered in Peru, in Mexico. Just as a systematic description of the physical and the sociological setting of the New World, that would make it a remarkable book. But it's more. No, first of all, it's written in Spanish. It is written for a general audience. This was a generation before Galileo started writing in Italian. This Jesuit author is writing in the vernacular and popularizing science. He's spreading it to an audience beyond a scholar who might be fluent in Latin. And it goes beyond that. Other authors had already written about the New World and all the strange things you can find in South America. But Acosta writes, and I quote, till now I have not seen an author who dares to find the causes and reasons of the new and strange things of nature, natural things that fall outside of the generally accepted philosophy. For example, think of this, at the equator, in South America, there's jungles, Brazil, the Amazon. We're used to that. But Aristotle had written that the regions near the equator should be extremely, extremely dry and hot, like the Sahara. Acosta points this out, and he says of Aristotle, though he was a great philosopher, he was wrong on this point. Again, a generation before Galileo, criticizing Aristotle. He discusses the origin of the trade winds, which we now know are tied to the rotation of the earth. He attributes them to the rotation of the sphere above the earth. 
He notices the uniform motion of tides in both the Atlantic and the Pacific, and he attributes them to the action of the moon, and he's right, and Galileo was wrong about that. He was one, among the first to describe altitude sickness. Anybody who's been to the mountains of Peru will know what he's talking about there. Most notably, he was the one who first suggested that the indigenous peoples in South America originated from Asia and came to America by some kind of land bridge between the Americas and Asia. And this was long before that part, you know, where the Bering Strait is now had ever been explored. He wasn't the only Jesuit scientist of note. One of the early Jesuits working in the field of mathematics was Father Christopher Clavius. He was instrumental in promoting mathematics as an important part of the curriculum in Jesuit schools. Until then, mathematics was considered just something that uh, was a tool that maybe you might need for bookkeeping, but not a proper academic subject. And he said, no, mathematics was a proper academic subject. This presaged Galileo, who called himself both a mathematician and a philosopher. And everyone says this was remarkable for Galileo, and it was remarkable for Galileo. Clavius was there first. Clavius is probably best known for being part of the commission that Pope Gregory XIII organized to reform the calendar. And I won't go into all the details of the reform of the calendar, but among many things that they did in the reform in 1582 was a new way of calculating the date of Easter and then all the other feasts that are tied to when Easter is. The reform was promulgated in 1582. 20 years later, Clavius issued a big book. I, we've got a copy of this book. It's, it's big. A big book that explains the calendar in great detail and then gives tables of when Easter will be up to the year 5,000. <laughs> this is what he has for the year 2022 and 2023. He was the general, and you can see he's got the dates right. It's because Easter is no longer actually tied to where the moon is and, and where the, it's not the first Sunday after the first full moon. It's an arbitrary formula that gets that right 15 years out of 17. And as I said, don't get me started unless you really want to you know, know more than you wanted to know about calendars. Clavius was a generation ahead of Galileo. They did overlap. They corresponded. A young Galileo actually asked Clavius for a letter of recommendation because he was trying to get a teaching job, which sadly he didn't get at that point. Clavius lived long enough to be able to look through Galileo's telescope and see the moons of Jupiter. In fact, the Jesuits were originally among Galileo's early supporters, but there was a rivalry over precedence of who was the first to use a telescope and of, uh, for various objects, and eventually this led to a falling out. Notable in this regard was a dispute between Father Orazio Grassi and Galileo. You probably heard about this green comet that was in the news last week. How many people here have actually seen that comet? Yeah, exactly. Comets that can be seen by the naked eye are quite rare. In the year 1618, there were three of them. Grassi was the first person to point a telescope at one of the comets and actually observe it. And he and his colleagues, other Jesuits in Germany, were able to compare for a given night at a given time where the comet looked compared to the stars from one vantage point to another vantage point. And they saw the comet was in the exact same place, which meant there was no parallax, that the comet must have been far enough away that you couldn't see a difference in location. This meant that the comet, in fact, had to be farther away than the moon. Because from different points on Earth, you can see a parallax of, of the moon. It's far hard to see, but it can be seen. Now, if you believe that comets, like everything in space, orbit the sun 
in circular orbits. This is very hard to explain because comets' motions are very different from the motions of the planets. It's equally hard to fit into other systems, but certainly it did not agree with the Copernican system. And as a result, Galileo was convinced that comets were not orbiting the sun because it meant that the Copernican system would be wrong. Copernicus, of course, only had circular orbits. Over the next four years, Galileo and uh, <clears throat> Grassi exchange pamphlets. They write books back and forth, each of them very cleverly insulting the other one, and the insults grow and grow. Ultimately, Galileo produces a book called The Assayer, which is his masterpiece of philosophy of science. He dedicated it to the Pope, Urban VIII, who was a friend of his. It was written in Italian with great wit and great sarcasm, and in it, he makes the principle, which is a principle of science to this day, that we must rely on data, not the received wisdom of the ancients. And after he says we must believe what the data tells us, he then says he doesn't believe the data about comets. But that's a different story. The truth is, and this is something that come, sometimes gets forgotten, the scientific evidence in favor of the Copernican system was not nearly as strong then as it is today. Jesuit scientists were among those who were trying to figure out was Copernicus right or wrong. And they were among those who were trying to examine the Copernican cosmology from a scientific point of view. And most notable is Giovanni Battista Riccioli of the Society of Jesus, as you see here, in a book 20 years after the infamous Galileo trial. I refer you to a book by a Vatican Observatory adjunct, Christopher Graney, on Riccioli, what he wrote in his book, the arguments he came up with. The arguments at the time, in terms of the science, were difficult to get around. For one thing, by looking at the planets, you cannot determine a difference between a system of Copernicus where the planets are going around the sun, including the Earth, or a system, according to Tycho Brahe, where the Earth is stationary, the moon goes around the Earth, the sun goes around the Earth, and then all the other planets are going around the sun. And if you think of it, the two systems are identical except for a, mo a moving of the, the origin. And that means that no observation of the planets can tell the difference between one and the other. Why would you choose one over the other? Because of an issue called parallax. If the Earth were actually moving and you could see a star that's slightly closer to us compared to stars that are farther away, the view of that star from one point in the Earth's orbit would look different from the view of that star at a different point in the Earth's orbit. Obviously, this picture exaggerates tremendously the difference. But Tycho Brahe was able to measure the positions of stars to an exceedingly high precision, about 10 arc seconds, even before there were telescopes and he saw no such parallax. <clears throat> Either the stars are enormously far away so you wouldn't see a parallax, or the Earth is standing still. When you look at a star through a telescope, you see a fuzzy dot. This is because of optics and the wave nature of light, but they didn't know that. They thought they were seeing the actual size of the star. If the stars were the size they calculated from the size of the fuzzy dot, then they had to be close to us. And therefore, the fact we don't see a parallax means the Earth was not moving. Or else the stars were enormously large, which is ridiculous, though some people believe that. The other thing that Riccioli is famous for, though, is that he also made 
the first modern map of the moon using a telescope and invented the nomenclature that we still use to this day, where the dark areas are called seas or oceans and named for various moods or, or the sea of vapors, the sea of serenity, the sea of tranquility. And the craters are named for prominent scientists. He names the most prominent crater on the moon for Copernicus, even though he argued in favor of the Tycho Brahe system. And he includes on the moon craters named for Galileo and Kepler and Aristarchus, the Greek who also believed that the sun was the center of the solar system. And they're all in the same part of the moon. And he names a crater for himself also in that part of the moon. All of them are very far from Tycho. Was he trying to say something? Well, <laughs> hard to say. There's also uh, right near uh, Tycho, I didn't uh, circle it, is a, a crater called Clavius. And if you saw the movie 2001, A Space, Op uh, Space Odyssey, that's where the moon base was in Crater Clavius. In fact, the naming of features on the moon follows the patterns that Riccioli set up, including having craters named for Jesuits. He had named about 30 craters on the moon for Jesuits, and he used Latin as a way of naming them. <clears throat> so you need to know Latin grammar if you're going to be a part of the nomenclature group. As it happens, I currently serve as the chair of the Mars task group for naming features on Mars under the International Astronomical Union and part of their working group on planetary systems nomenclature. I think they gave me the job because they think that I know Latin. <laughs> I did study Latin in high school, but that was a long time ago. Fortunately, I do know people who do know Latin, which is good enough. Roger Boscovich was another Jesuit scientist a generation later. So now we're moving into the 1700s. When he was a young Jesuit, the Jesuits had a general congregation, number 16, where they said that the Aristotelian system has to be taught in the Jesuit schools, that's what Rome wanted. But at the same time, the Jesuit schools were free to teach Newton's physics. This was a way of supporting the church authorities who needed Aristotle because their theology was based on Aristotelian philosophy and yet was open to modern science. Boscovich earned his fame in 1742 when there was a crack discovered in the Dome of St. Peter's and he figured out a way of fixing it, which was pretty good. He was among those who worked to have the Vatican lift its prohibition against teaching heliocentrism, and that happened in 1757. And he wrote a very important book on the atomic theory, which came out in 1758. It's interesting to note that even before this, for the last hundred years, the Copernican system was taught in Jesuit schools, not as a way of explaining how the planets moved, but as a mathematical system that was very useful for calculating the positions of planets. So they weren't afraid of the system, they just thought that science couldn't explain it. Soon after this was accepted, the ceiling of the Jesuit college in Prague has this painting put on it where you see these little angels looking through telescopes at many stars, all of which are surrounded by orbits of planets and little lines that look like uh, comets. 1760. In 1736, Boscovich was one of the people who observed a transit of Mercury the planet Mercury's orbit was just such that you could see it cross in front of the sun. And that was a nice curiosity, but he recognized that this could be a really important observation. And it was going to happen with Venus in 1761 and again in 1769. And these 
observations occur twice every 120 odd years. The last time they occurred was 2004 and then 2012, and it won't happen for another 100 years or so. If you observe Venus crossing the sun from two very different locations on Earth, and you know your distance from each other on Earth, and you can compare where the tracing of Venus was going, crossing the sun, you can do fancy trigonometry to work out the number of kilometers from you to Venus compared to the number of kilometers from one observer to another. One of the great you know, achievements of the 18th century. Based on this measurement, you can calculate the distance to Venus, Knowing the relative positions of the planets, you then work out the distances to all of the other planets and the size of the sun and the moon. And this is the first step that eventually allows you to measure the distance to other stars, the size of our own galaxy, the distance to other galaxies. It's one of the primary rungs of what's called the distance ladder. And this was done in the 1760s. A quarter of all the observatories in Europe were run by the Jesuits. And they observed this transit from many locations, from Austria, from Sweden, where it was illegal to be a Jesuit, but they got special permission from the King of Sweden to have an expedition to the north of Sweden. Missionaries in China. Arguably, the most notable of Jesuit scientists was in the, eight, uh, the 19th century, Angelo Secchi possibly the greatest scientist you've never heard of. <clears throat> Hope they can cut that part out in the recording. <laughs> Angelo Secchi was remarkable. He built the first electromechanical device that would record meteorological data. He had a big box that ran on electricity, ran off batteries, that had a needle which would record the temperature and the pressure and the wind speed so you didn't have to have some poor fellow write this down by hand every hour. From that you begin to get patterns of weather, weather understood. He set up a system of weather reporting using the telegraph so that different people in different parts of Europe could communicate with each other what the weather was doing. He provided practical applications of science to civic life from timekeeping to the proper drainage of cities to making buildings that were earthquake proof, very important in Italy. He helped found the first magnetic observatory in Italy, measuring the magnetic field of the earth and how it changed. He invented something called the Secchi disk, which is still used today to, it, it's a disk with white and black lines, you lower it in water and how deep you can still see the black and white lines compared to the depth of the water is a repeatable measure of how clear the water is. People still use that to this day. He investigated the origin of hail and other meteorological phenomenon. He installed sundials and lighthouses in the Papal States. He surveyed the Appian Way. Remember at this time, the area around Rome was still a country independent of Italy run by the Pope. He played a key role in the revision of the metric system and all of those pale. He was the fellow who invented modern astrophysics and modern planetary sciences. Let me tell you about that and basically how that came to be. 1848 was a time of great upheaval in Europe. And in November of 1848, Garibaldi's armies entered Rome. The Pope was forced to flee. He went off to Naples. The Jesuits were expelled. In exile, young Father Secchi first came to England, to Stonyhurst College. And that's where he first learned astronomy because they've got a little observatory. He spent a semester there and then went to Georgetown University in the US where he met a famous meteorologist, that's where he met meteorology. In 1849, the French army marches back into Rome, kicks out Garibaldi, 
the Pope returns, the Papal States are reestablished, at least for the small area around Rome. And Secchi is brought back to Rome where he is made the director of the Observatory of the Roman College. He's 31 years old. Now, the interesting thing is, he's not really an astronomer. His training was in physics. So he looked at the world through the eyes of a physicist. And one of the first things he knew was he wanted a modern telescope. I don't know how many of you have been to Rome if you have ever seen the Church of St. Ignatius. Remember St. Ignatius, founder of the Jesuits? There's a church named for him. On the left, you see the dome of the Church of St. Ignatius. It's a beautiful dome. It's a fake. <laughs> they ran out of money. They built a flat ceiling and hired a Jesuit artist to paint the dome in perspective. That picture is taken from directly below the dome looking straight up. But it means that the church had four pillars designed to carry the weight of a dome, but the dome was never made. So Secchi put his telescopes on those pillars. It was high above the city lights, and so the, the, the city, you know, areas. It was stable. It wouldn't shake in the wind. Incidentally, the designer of that church was Orazio Grassi. Remember Grassi, the, the big rival of Galileo. And buried in that church is, is uh, <clears throat> Cardinal Bellarmine, who was the one who had that conversation with Galileo. So there's a lot of astronomical connections there. One of the other things that Secchi did was to study the sun, he was one of the first people to photograph a total eclipse of the sun. So you see this, this uh, you know, corona around the sun. He then compared it with photographs made elsewhere who showed that the corona was the same in all of the photographs and therefore what you're looking at is something actually attached to the sun and not just something that you saw in the atmosphere over where he happened to be. His work looking at the sun and solar activity and comparing it to magnetic fields on Earth eventually led to the recognition of what we now call the, the sun-Earth connection, the connection between solar activity and changes in the Earth's magnetic field, which is now very important since we depend on the Earth's magnetic field for a lot of transmission and protection against so, solar input for the transmission of electricity over high tension wires, for radio signals. It's so important that NASA has a pair of spacecraft always looking at the sun from two different directions called the stereo spacecraft. And each of them has the sun-earth connection coronal and heliospheric investigation. There's fame to have your name turned into a NASA acronym. It will never happen with Consul Magno. But I mentioned that his most important feat was inventing astrophysics. What do I mean by that? Frederick Bessel, great mathematician of that era, wrote in 1832, what astronomy must do has always been clear to lay down the rules for determining the motions of heavenly bodies as they appear from the earth. Everything else that you might think you could learn about heavenly bodies is not of astronomical interest. That's an odd thing to say. But at the same time, the French philosopher is describing a kind of knowledge that we know must exist, but which is always removed from the possibility of human beings having it. For instance, he says, Every research in relation to the stars not reducible to their visual observations, their positions, is, perforce, barred to us. We could never study, by any means, their chemical composition or their mineral structure. Our positive knowledge of the stars is necessarily restricted just to their geometric, you know, where they are. 
It's impossible to undertake any physical or chemical or physiological research about the stars. You can't get to the stars. How could you ever know what they were made of? Well, in 1859, Kirchhoff and Bunsen showed that the missing dark lines in the rainbow that you cut from the color of a glowing gas tells you the chemical's presence. In fact, a couple of bright stars are even looked at this. Second, builds a prism that fits in front of the lens and look 5,000 stars. And these Classifies them into a small number of different classes. Notice what he's doing here. He is changing the question of what astronomy does. It's no longer where are the stars, it is what are the stars. And even more, he is saying that stars come in certain restricted classes. In one of them, he even recognizes that the lines being absorbed are the lines due to carbon. We still call these carbon stars. This ultimately became the, the, the system that was adapted and expanded in what we now call the, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. This is the fundamental starting point of understanding the physics, the evolution, the way stars behave, what they're made out of, how they glow, how hot they are, how they evolve in time. All of the astronomy we do starts here. But he does that not just with stars, but also with planets. He used his telescope to find the spectra of the atmospheres of, of the outer planets, discovering carbon there. He discusses the nature of the clouds of Jupiter. Most famously, he looks at Mars, sees light and dark regions, and says that the dark regions are sort of like channels, using the Italian word canali, which would be misunderstood by an American a generation later into thinking that Mars was covered with canals. The point is, he also changes the study of planets from measuring their orbits to an ever higher precision and doing the math to calculate their orbits. Astronomy for most of the 19th century was done in the mathematics department. And he's moved astronomy to the physics department and he's moved the study of planets to the geology department. He sees them as places in and of themselves. He's the father of planetary science. When Rome was occupied again in 1870 and the anti-clerical Italian government conquers everything except the area just around the Vatican, he has to give up the chair of astrophysics at the Roman University. Um, the Italian government threatens to take away his observatory, but his reputation in Europe is so great that the Italian government is afraid to kick him out. And he stays the director of the observatory until he dies at age 59 in 1878. There's one final thing I want to mention about Secchi, because it's important. I mentioned that instrument that he invented. This is a picture of it, the meteoro meteorograph which won the gold medal at the Paris Exposition in 1867. This was the, the gizmo that recorded weather. He got the Legion of Honor. He was part of a commission then that was proposed to redefine the meter. The commission was formed with national representatives. He was put on the committee of 1870, which held, was in Rome. And then in 1870 was the fall of Rome, as I mentioned. The work of the metric commission in Paris continued. In 1872, he shows up again and to, to continue his work on reforming the calendar. <clears throat> in 
the International Commission, as, as one of the books puts it, would not be deprived of the personal contribution and studies of Father Secchi, which were of great benefit to the work of the committee. The Italian government tells the Italian scientists to complain that Secchi no longer represents a real country and he should be kicked off the commission. And the other scientists said, we need him. If you Italians don't want to be part of it, you can go away. The Italians are kicked out and Secchi is kept. This is considered a tremendous personal success and the Vatican takes note that having a national representative among scientists is a way that the Vatican can continue to be recognized as a nation. When he comes back from this meeting, the Pope welcomes Secchi, and as Secchi's diary puts it, when Secchi walks into the room to meet the Pope, the Pope raises his hand and he says, I vote for Father Secchi, because there had been a vote of the scientists, and he had won the vote. The politics involved in this is something we'll come back to. Before I get to that, there's one other scientist I do want to mention. Um, James McElwaney was a Jesuit born in Port Clinton, Ohio in 1883. I grew up in the state next to Ohio and I've never heard of Point Clinton, so it's a pretty small town. He was one of eight children. He grew up on a farm. At age 15, he had to leave school to work on the farm. Three years later, he was able to go back and finish his high school education, and then in 1903, he enters the Jesuits. During his mandatory philosophy studies, which were in St. Louis, he showed an aptitude for natural sciences. He noticed an instrument that had been installed there, which was a seismometer, which would record earthquakes. He was fascinated by this. His superiors noted that, so they sent him to California, to the University of California at Berkeley, to study seismology. He got his doctorate there in 1923. His thesis discusses the propagation of seismic waves on the surface of the Earth. Berkeley earthquake zone seems logical to us. Not in 1923. His was the first thesis on seismology in North America. And he did it at a university that sits on top of what we now know as the, the San Andreas Fault. After, <clears throat> after we got his degree, he was assigned to go back to the Jesuit University in St. Louis. Well, we're very far from earthquakes. But he revived the Jesuit Seismological Association. There had been seismometers in all the Jes different Jesuit schools, but whoever had organized that had died and nobody had done anything about it. He brought it back again. He got somebody at every Jesuit school to keep track of seismic waves and to compare the timing of a seismic wave from one location compared to another, which allows you to determine where the earthquake actually occurred. It tells you not only the place on the map, but also the depth of the earthquake. In the process, it allows you to work out the boundaries of the different layers of the earth, where the crust ends, where the mantle ends, where the core begins. During the Cold War, this technique turned out to be really important because this was a way that the Americans and the Russians could make sure that they were following the ban on underground testing of nuclear weapons. This was so important that the American government took over the Jesuit seismic network. And they're the ones to this day who maintain this network, that and the American uh, National Science Foundation. Meanwhile, McElwaney is at St. Louis University. Though he doesn't have earthquakes, he has materials that he can measure the seismic wave travel times, the velocity of seismic waves in different kinds of rocks, which means once you've worked out that an earthquake occurred at a certain place and how long it took for the rocks to, you know, the, the material, the, the waves to get to your seismometer, you can then infer what was the material that they were passing through. The American Geophysical Union to this day has a medal given to 
young scientists for outstanding achievements by a young scientist. St. Louis doesn't have a whole lot of earthquakes, but it's in the American Midwest. It has a lot of weather. So we also started doing meteorology. He, in fact, wrote textbooks of meteorology. His classes and his textbooks both created a new generation of seismometers, seismologists, and meteorologists. And in honor of his work, the American Meteorological Society also has a McElwaney Award for outstanding students in meteorology. Go back now to the end of the 19th century, the conquering of Rome, <clears throat> the political turmoil that affects where Jesuits can work. The same sort of turmoil that caused Angelo Secchi to be kicked out of Rome in 1848 continues through the wars, you know, the 1870 wars. By the end of the 19th century, Jesuit science was being used in an apologetic role because <clears throat> the Italian government puts up this monument to Bruno as a martyr to science, which would have been a, sh a shock to Bruno. Bruno had never heard of science. Scientific work until the middle of the 19th century was actually a normal part of the activity of the clergy. In so many parts of the world, especially where there were missionaries, the only people with the education and the free time to make and collect scientific measurements were clergymen. And you know, what does a, a parish priest or a parish uh, minister do? They keep track of births and deaths and make sure that you're not marrying your cousin, that sort of thing. It's record keeping. That's what most of science is. It's record keeping. We call it clerical work because it was done by clerics. By the 1870s, though, there were all sorts of pressures in secular society and in the church that is putting a strain on this relationship. On the one hand, you've got the Enlightenment anti-clericalism, the, the idea that science is somehow going to replace religion. On the other hand, in the church, you also have a sometimes uncreative and even stubborn response to the Enlightenment ideas. The rapid development of technology in the 19th century led to what's sometimes called the Whig philosophy, the Whig myth of the inevitability of progress and the expected triumph of technology over the older ways of looking at things. And these are reflected in the rise of the 19th century secular university, especially in Germany. So you don't have universities run by the church anymore. You can't trust church people. Instead, you have universities set up by lay people, often anti-clerical lay people. In Italy, the Italian anti-clerical government that conquered Rome, they'd imprisoned the, Vat the Pope in the Vatican, they built this monument to the self-styled magician and charlatan Giordano Bruno and made it out as if he was a martyr to modern science. You read his stuff, you realize what he was talking about was not science. But that wasn't what they wanted you to think. In America, there were anti-immigrant activities fueled by books like Andrew Dixon White's book on the history of the warfare of science with theology in Christendom. Andrew Dixon White was the fellow who founded Cornell University. He argues that Catholic nations from the southern and eastern part of Europe were sending too many people to America, people with vowels at the end of their names like Consul Magno. And we have to keep them out because the church was obviously anti-science. The American government actually passes very strong quotas so that after the, the act of 1924, 90, the, the immigration from Italy fell by 90%. Immigration to America from Asia was completely banned. This movement is tied to another movement of science and popular science in the end of the 19th, early 20th century that we now call eugenics. Eugenics was a misuse of Darwin's idea of evolution as a way of breeding superior human beings. You 
sterilize the unfit. And it was allied with social Darwinism, a sociological system that was used to maintain rigid social classes and racial discrimination. The fact that I'm rich and you're poor isn't because somehow I had an unfair advantage. It's because it was natural selection. It was science. Clearly, I'm superior to you. And for that matter, people who look like me must be superior to people who look like you. That was the philosophy of eugenics. The church was one of the few groups to speak out against this on the basis that it was immoral. We now know, of course, it was terrible science as well. But the fact that the church would speak out against it meant that the church was being attacked as being anti-science. Unfortunately, within the church itself, one reaction to this was a kind of triumphalism, a sense that the church clearly was better than this modern world and we should be paying no attention to this modern world and be very suspicious to all of this. Pope Leo XIII didn't buy into this triumphalism. He recognized Secchi's international repute. He recognized that the church had to be seen as not anti-science. He was the pope who also wrote a, an encyclical in favor of labor unions and re, you know, responding to the social changes happening at the time. In the same year that that encyclical, De Reverum Novus, came out, he also refounded the Vatican Observatory that everyone might see that the church and her pastors are not opposed to true and solid science, but that they embrace it, encourage it, and promote it. The Vatican Observatory itself took part in a big international astronomical project. 18 nations were given or were purchased identical telescopes like this one to photograph the sky in what was called the Carte du Ciel, again, organized by the French. Italy had one of these Carte du Ciel telescopes and was given one part of the sky to photograph. The Vatican had a different telescope and a different part of the sky, as if it was a separate nation, which it believed it was. Finally, in 1929, Italy and the Vatican signed an agreement where Italy recognized the Vatican as an independent country and gave the Vatican back the territory that the popes had had in the little mountain village of Castel Gandolfo, about an hour outside Rome, in a palace that had been built by the Barberinis in the 1500s. In one of those floors, Pope Pius XI invited German scientists to restaff the Vatican Observatory, to create a laboratory where they would measure the spectra of pure metals so that these spectra the spectra of, of stars. The journal Spectra Chemica Acta was actually founded there. To this day, the Vatican continues to play an active role in astronomy. The Vatican, uh, the members of the International Astronomical Union are members by nation. Italy has members, Britain has members, the Vatican has members. We were key in the decision of how we determine the nomenclature of Pluto. In this photograph is a friend of mine, Rick Benzel, to the left. Father Christopher Corbelly in the center, and Jocelyn Bell Burnell in the right. She's holding a, a, a stuffed dog representing Pluto. The actual definition was written by Father Chris Corbelly. As I mentioned, you know, we, we Jesuits were involved in nomenclature. Incidentally, if you think that this was somehow an insult to Pluto, that Pluto was somehow demoted, that somehow being a planet is better than being a dwarf planet or an asteroid, you're guilty of planetism. <laughs> Today, the Vatican Observatory has a dozen researchers from seven nations, four continents. 
We work in a wide range of field with doctorates from a wide, wide range of topics. One of the notable things about the astronomy we do is we're supported by the Vatican, not by some three-year grant from another government. That means we don't have to worry about having research that has a result after three years or we don't get the grant renewed. We can do long-term survey projects like the spectra of metals, projects that take 10 or 20 years to come to fruition. This is science that the rest of astronomy needs, but no one else could pay for. Sometimes we call it orphan science. One of the examples of this is work that my colleague Bob Mackey and I are doing, measuring the physical properties of meteorites. When we first started this work, measuring the density, and then could we have all the 1,000 meteorites, there are all the different types, we can make these measurements. When I first started presenting this work, one of the grand old men in the field of meteoritics came up to me and said, Guy, why are you measuring meteorite densities? Nobody does that. That's why I was doing it, because no one else could do it. It took a solid 10 years of measurements going to meteorite collections around the world before we had a big enough data ta table that we could begin to come up with some really interesting trends. It turns out that this work is essential for our understanding of asteroids and their evolution. And once we started publishing, other people were able to get into the field and get grant money. And our collaborators have since purchased some of the instruments that we use. So eventually we get the grant money. But we were able to do that only because we didn't have to worry about the grant money ahead of time. Bob, who's the fellow down below, is holding up a rock that looks like a meteorite, but actually it's a moon rock. He has been invited to do these measurements at the Johnson Space Center on moon rocks. He's been invited to do these measurements on the samples that the NASA mission uh, OSIRIS-REx is bringing back from asteroid Bennu. He's the leading expert on this technique in the world. He's also one of the leading curators of meteorites in the world and has held meetings of meteorite curators at the Vatican. And of course, since we all have you know, backgrounds in philosophy and theology, we're also called on to philosophize about science and theology, which is great fun. The interesting thing is that being a Jesuit in science gives you certain advantages that other scientists don't have, but also certain disadvantages. Think of uh, that fellow McElwaney, raised on a farm, had to work for a few years before he could even finish high school. When he entered the Jesuits, the Jesuits paid for him to go to university. Think of Acosta, who was sent to South America. Going to South America in the 1500s would be like going to the moon. Hardly anybody got to do that, but the Jesuits got to do that. You not only were able to travel internationally, but you had a network of other collaborators. So Grassi had someone in Germany that he knew, a fellow Jesuit, and he could compare the observations of comets from two different places. Galileo didn't have that network. Jesuits just being Jesuits have access to people with power. Boscovich could talk to the Pope about fixing the dome of St. Peter's and then say, by the way, we need to fix what we're saying about Copernicus. We don't have to worry about being funded. We don't have families to support. No matter you know, what, what happens, they're going to feed me. I have, I've taken a vow of poverty, but on the other hand, I never have to worry about where my next meal is coming from. That means we are free to choose projects like orphan science. Some of the downsides. We do study theology and philosophy, and that takes time. Bob Mackey, who I mentioned, has this laboratory, set up this laboratory when he was 40 years old. Most scientists would be 25 when they set up a lab. But he had all of this other formation he had to go through. We are under a vow of obedience. I'm in Rome because they sent me there. Tomorrow, they could send me someplace else. Acosta, who was doing this great work in South America, was pulled back to become the rector of the university in, in Spain. 
If you're a Jesuit, you have doors that are open to you, but you also immediately have people who are going to decide that you're part of the enemy, that uh, <clears throat> you can't trust them, that you have to be expelled from the country because of political upheaval. The expectations of the church can put strains on the way the Jesuits present their work. No matter how much that I tell you that when I present science, I'm speaking for myself, somebody in the audience is going to say, ah, the official Vatican position on whatever thing on meteorites I say. That's going to happen, whether we want it to or not. Jesuits are seen as speaking for the church. It's seen in the way we present the results. We have to present the results in a way that isn't going to bring scandal to the church. Now, you're thinking, what kind of scandal can come from doing astronomy? Well, go on to the internet. <laughs> Did you know that the Vatican is involved in secret alien plans that are tied up with CERN? I was surprised about that. <laughs> There's a Vatican astronomer quoted on this book of Exo Vaticana, Petrus Romanus, Project Lucifer and the Vatican's astonishing plan for the arrival of an alien savior. I am quoted on the internet as saying that Jesus was a hybrid of an alien. And go, go, go. <clears throat> it happens. What can you do? There's a more subtle problem. The kind of work that we do as Jesuits, science that everybody needs, no one else is willing to pay for, can also mean that the work we do is often not appreciated. You don't get a Nobel Prize for putting together a table of data. In the 19th century, the Whig historian and politician, Thomas Macaulay, once wrote that being a Jesuit has a tendency to suffocate rather than develop original genius. Mind you, this is exactly the time that Secchi was doing all of these incredible things. But since Macaulay didn't read Italian, and Secchi's enemies in Britain, especially the editor of Nature, made sure that none of his works were translated into English. It was a time of jealous anti-Catholic uh, prejudice, especially among British scientists. In a deeper sense, this goes to the motivation behind the work. Why does a Jesuit do science? The unspoken assumption of someone like Macaulay is that you do science for the glory. You do science to demonstrate your genius. To a Jesuit, the glory that comes from the science is supposed to be the greater glory of God, the creator not for the person who happens to have uncovered some detail of that creation. Certainly not for the guy who got the grant. Research becomes, rather than something to glorify yourself, it becomes a form of prayer. Which is to say, we do the science for love. The love of the science itself, the love of the truth, the love of the church that brings us to the author of that science, the author of that truth, the love of the creator, in whom we find in all created things. Ignatian spirituality gives us Jesuits a way of looking at the cosmos so that we find our way in this universe. We are able to put human logic on the stars. It makes us look up at the stars along with St. Ignatius in awe at their beauty, in awe of the mere fact that they exist, but it also leads us to engage, engage our minds as well as our hearts, to see the order in the chaos, to see in it the hand of the Creator. When we look on the chaos, when we look on the cosmos, we look on the hand of the Creator, and that's where we encounter God. Thank you very much. So.
So as I <coughs> said at the beginning, there is a, a short opportunity to ask questions. If you'd like to do so, could I ask you to keep the questions as brief as possible? And also we have two uh, runners who have microphones. So if you raise your hand, then um, they'll maybe see uh, you and be able to get you. We'll take a question from here first. And thank you very much for that beautiful lecture. I was slightly interested in what you said about Clavius and the mathematics curriculum. This was around 1500 something, I guess. The late 1580s, early right. 1600, yeah. Right. But isn't it right that arithmetic was part of the trivium and uh, geometry was part of the quadrivium? It, uh, arithmetic and geometry are both part of the quadrivium. Oh, it was quadrivium, okay, both of but, them, right, right. But those, I mean, the, 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 the trivium were the trivial courses, grammar sure. school. The quadrivium were still the preparatory courses. A true scholar studies theology or philosophy. Right. And to this day, even if you're a mathematician, your degree is doctor of philosophy. So, Mathematics at that time was not considered something for grown-ups. It was considered something that allowed you to analyze the universe that then you could philosophize about. So it was a, a route to something else. It was not worthy of study in and of itself until Clavius came along and promoted otherwise in the, the Jesuit uh, Studium uh, Ratio. Well, I, I understand that it was elevated in some way, but it was part of the curriculum, was it? It was part of the curriculum, but not part of the doctoral curriculum. Okay, thank you. Thank you. There was a question on this side. Uh, Marta, if you could maybe come down, gentleman with a red shirt. Thank you. And if you just pass the microphone back once you've asked your question, that will help us move things along. Thank you. Thank you, Father Consuelma. Um, very late in your um, presentation, you mentioned um, the vow of obedience. Um, I was being taught by a, um, a, a Dominican um, recently. I wonder if you could say a very few words about how a Jesuit might understand the vow and construct the vow of obedience compared with, say, a Dominican, and whether that perhaps promotes different views of the, um, the world of science. The um, best way to describe the vow of obedience from a Jesuit is there is both obedience to your superior who will assign you to go places, who has the power to say, don't do that. If I was a political activist and I was going to go to a uh, demonstration where I'm likely to get arrested, I have to have permission to get arrested. And otherwise, you know, if, if I don't have that permission, I shouldn't be going to that demonstration. But it is also, I think, similar to the kind of relationship that a married couple might have. You're so devoted to each other that you can argue without fear that this is going to destroy the relationship. That's not an easy thing to get to. Jesuits have been known sometimes to speak out against what they see in the church, but it's from the point of view of, if you tell me to shut up, I'll shut up. But while we're talking, let's bring these things out and talk about this stuff. Likewise, the vow of poverty, the Jesuit idea of a vow of poverty is different from a Franciscan where, who tries to live like a poor person. A Jesuit tries to live so that material goods are completely irrelevant. And if you're at a university, you should live like other university professors, not better, not worse, but as an equal. If you're living in the inner city, you should live like somebody in the inner city. If you're under obedience asked to move from the university to go to the inner city, you go, okay, because it doesn't matter to you, because that's not what's important. And the vow of celibacy, of course, is to give you the freedom to be able to move to any of these places without worrying about your wife and kids to give you the freedom to be able to dedicate yourself in this way. Thank you. And there's another question here on this side. Yeah. First of all, thank you for the lecture. It was really, really interesting. I'm a student here at Harriet Watt, and it seems that a sort of defining characteristic among people my age is the non-adherence to religion, or maybe even the rejection of religion. And I was wondering, from a theological perspective, 
is this just a transitory phase for society? Or in other words, the question could be phrased as, how do you predict the relationship between religion and society over the next 50 to 100 years in terms of young people? Well, um, I'm an old guy, but I used to be a young guy. <laughs> and in the 60s, we also claimed that we didn't need religion anymore. And our parents despaired because nobody was going to church. I actually did a survey of, of engineers and scientists at Silicon Valley. I had a, a chance to do this during one time in my Jesuit formation. And what I found was that a lot of engineers and scientists when they're in college are still curious about the universe and their place in it and what's right and what's wrong, but they've given up an organized religion. And then they get married and they start a family and they join their wife's church. <laughs> um, often it's the wife who is the engineer, but she still gets to decide what the church is. And even though they're back in a church, they still have a certain cynicism about organized religion. So it's not as clear a division as you might think. One of the things that you more often hear is, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. The trouble with that is, where did you hear about spirituality? Where did you hear about techniques that you can use to try to figure out who God is? Where do you even hear that there might be a God? I'm a planetary scientist working at the Vatican. That means that I work pretty intimately with a big, overbearing, incredibly bureaucratic, bureaucratic organization, sometimes run by idiots, who seem to get in the way of all the good things they're trying to do, and they can drive you nuts. Why do I put up with it? Because NASA is the only organization that was able to get us to the moon. <laughs> Thank you. And the argument for big religion is much the same as the argument for big science. It can drive you nuts, but it also gives you the opportunity to do things that a person, an individual on their own can't do. Thank you, and thank you for those uh, questions. I'm sure many more of you have questions that you would lo love to put, but our time is uh, sadly running on. And so I'd like to invite Professor John Sawkins uh, to express something of our appreciation for this evening's lecture. Thank you, Jill. Well, it's my very great pleasure on behalf of everyone here in the lecture hall and online um, to give our sincere thanks to Guy uh, for helping to, us to explore once again the interfaith between religion and science, and to do so through the lens of uh, History Guy and uh, the lives of some really remarkable people within your order as well. And to take a long view, I, um, just how long of you hit home when um, you put on the screen the tables of the dates to Easter and other feasts worked out from uh, 1582 to the year, was it 5,000? Uh, which rather uh, puts into the shade our own pride in getting the academic timetable worked out for next year. <laughs> And you've also reminded us of one of the less welcome legacies of the Enlightenment as well, the strain it put on the relationship between religion and science, which certainly in this city of Edinburgh had walked with each other hand in hand for hundreds of years prior to that. And this idea, this false idea, I think, of there being an inherent conflict between religion and science has in some places and at its worst led to this um, destructive tribal mindset um, in which people spend time throwing rocks at each other from afar rather than building relationships to foster learning and understanding. So as an institution we take great pride in events such as this in which we open that space up um, for honest debate and the search for truth. And why do we do this? Because of some innate human need to learn, to seek out, to research, to explore. And that is a human impulse, which if you like, higher education is there to nurture 
and support and foster and grow. And what underpins that? Um, for some, of course, it's money, as he said, or fame, um, or other forms of success. But as you also said, for many, many, it is love. Love of the science itself, love of truth, and love of the author of that truth. So Guy, I think I speak for us all when I say you have offered us much to think, think about, much to reflect on, and much to discuss with each other. Please accept our sincere thanks for all you have shared with us at this session. And now before we move out of the hall to continue the discussion with each other, I invite us all to show our appreciation to our speaker in the usual way. Thank you. Thank you.